I will try to look into over this at the end when we come to the question sessions and call people based on the questions. The other way you can also do is by raise your hand. And the way to do that is if you click uh, on the list of participants, um, you should um, you should open the bar on the right and there is a place there that says raise hand and it will put you on the top of the list so I can see that you have requested to to speak or, or ask a question. Um, the, yeah, thanks, so that's all. So we'll get, get a start. So it's, it's a great uh, honor and a privilege to be able to introduce uh, Yanis Bentikos, Professor Yanis Bentikos from UCL. He's a Kennedy Professor in Mechanical Engineering and also head of the Mechanical Engineering Department in UCL. And he has been uh, working uh, and in, across a number of countries in, in Greece, where he's originally from France, um, the US, um, and Switzerland. Um, and he has now been in the UK, both in Oxford and, and UCL now. Uh, he works across a number of uh, domains, but his main interest is in, in transport phenomena and fluid dynamics, uh, both in the areas of biomedical engineering problems, but also in energy and innova innovative industrial processes and, and biocomplexity. And um, I will put as well a link to his profile through the chat so that people can have a bit more look into publications and other work uh, if you wish so. Uh, and without further ado, I'd like to welcome you, jo uh, Yanis, um, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. It's a great pleasure to be here, even virtually. I appreciate the invitation. Um, it is uh, difficult circumstances, challenging circumstances, and we, we need uh, to learn how to do things in a different way. I will start sharing my screen now so I can go to, uh, to presentation mode. And when this happens, uh, hopefully now, uh, nope, give me a second, stop sharing screen, sorry, that it will work, I'm sure. Uh, So, uh, as I was saying, it is uh, difficult circumstances and um, uh, it is very brave uh, for um, uh, IFD's part to run these events uh, virtually. Uh, usually things go well because uh, these are tech savvy groups that are involved and uh, this, is, uh, this is great. I do appreciate the invitation. I have to say I have participated in uh, mass Zoom events before, but never as a, as a sole presenter. So I hope I will uh, not mess this up. The, the presentation, the title of my presentation is, uh, is a long one, is uh, Transport Phenomena for Brain Biomechanics. And uh, I will be discussing computational modeling across a variety of scales. I will say a few introductory things first so that you know where I'm coming from. So, uh, as Alex said, uh, we work at uh, UCL uh, in the Faculty of Engineering Sciences and uh, in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Mechanical Engineering at UCL is a very broad department that encompasses everything from uh, tissue engineering to uh, marine engineering. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty big and pretty diverse department. Uh, Relevant to this talk is the fact that uh, UCL is uh, connected intimately. Basically, they belong to the same uh, entity uh, with a number of uh, well-known uh, hospitals like um, uh, the Royal Free, one of the most historical hospitals in, in London, the Great Ormond Street, uh, the National uh, Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery that's called Queen Square that does all the brain stuff. Uh, and uh, this connection with, uh, with, uh, with the medical world 
has informed to a great extent how uh, the, some of the directions the university has taken. So uh, healthcare engineering is very strong, is a very prominent uh, feature in uh, UCL. Uh, I want to say a couple of things. It would be uh, a miss of my part not to mention COVID, of course, right here. Uh, as you will understand from my talk, I am a computer modeling evangelist. So I really believe that there is a lot we can extract from simulation and from in silico systems, providing we ask the right questions. This is always important. So I have seen in the last uh, month and a half, two months, a lot of simulation work out there that uh, involves um, uh, modeling of uh, COVID-related uh, topics, like how do particles propagate, how do we get infected, what happens when you sneeze and everything, which is great. In many cases, this yields very interesting information. As an exercise, however, I try to look and see if there's anything we can do without supercomputers, with just pen and paper. And I found a very well-known formula actually by Stokes. This is the formula for settling velocity. So how fast do droplets fall? And uh, if you put the numbers in that formula, you can get that uh, a tiny droplet that is quite common when you, you sneeze or when you cough, for example, uh, will take several minutes or even tens of minutes, order of an hour, to drop half a meter or a few centimeters. So if you're out for a walk and someone sneezes a kilometer away and then walks and goes someplace else and after five, 10 minutes, you walk into the area that that person was, there is a very good chance that the cloud of droplets or particles is still in the air, it's still roughly at uh, head height. There are other considerations that have to do with uh, evaporation, with uh, humidity, with temperature, etc. But there is a lot of insight that we can get without going to supercomputers. What I'm going to discuss today, however, is what kind of insight you can get if you want to ask supercomputers the right kind of questions. So uh, the work we do, I'll just offer a very broad overview, like a few slides at the beginning regarding the work we do in the group, and then I'll go to something that's a lot more specific to my talk, uh, the brain biomechanics. We do a lot of uh, interesting things that have to do with transport phenomena and fluid mechanics, and um, the, the, the gauge, if you wish, the, the, the metric that um, puts us into a particular domain is whether it is interesting, if the science is interesting and exciting and new, and whether what we do is uh, useful. So I have collected a few examples that some of the, the guys in the department work on right now, like for example, uh, cases where uh, liquids and gases coexist in very violent condi conditions, in conditions where you have very strong shock waves, in conditions where the, the liquid water, for example, behaves as a very compressible uh, medium, quite different from what we learn let's say in more traditional fluid mechanics, you know, liquids are incompressible, not always. Uh, we do work on uh, lifting bodies and uh, I find this particular graphic uh, at the bottom of this page very pretty because it shows this uh, lovely braided tip vortex at the back, uh, at the tip of a, of a wing. And there is a lot of interesting information you can get both in terms of uh, how you simulate this type of very difficult flows, but also uh, some uh, considerations that used to be considered secondary, but now uh, they are right at the forefront, like noise generation. How can you make wings of, of aircraft or wings of uh, turbine blades, propellers, etc., be a lot more silent, a lot more quiet. Uh, getting warmer as far as the biomedical engineering bit, we have done a lot of work, some of it, a lot of it actually together with Alex, uh, that has to do with aneurysms. And uh, in aneurysms, we are looking both at um, devices and at the very top line, you see a, a modern and novel device that has not been actually received approval yet. It's something that's uh, literally brand new uh, that you put at the neck of an aneurysm in order to reduce flow. Uh, and therefore uh, eliminate or reduce the chance of the aneurysm breaking and creating, um, giving rise to a hemorrhage. And uh, in the middle of the page, you can see uh, 
the next step as far as this work is concerned uh, where we are bringing in additional physics to blood flow basically the the, the physics the chemistry uh, the biochemistry of thrombosis and we put chemodynamics the fluid mechanics of blood together with the biochemistry of the thrombotic process in order to see how thrombus grows inside an aneurysm uh, I will talk a lot about scales today. Scales are very important in, in uh, biomechanics and uh, the bottom uh, graphic there shows uh, the other end of the spectrum as far as the scales are concerned. This is a molecular level set of events that uh, focus that evolve around something that's called the, the vascular endothelial glycocalyx, which is a very thin nanometer thick uh, layer of uh, sugar basic molecules that lines the vessels of the human body uh, and uh, regulates in a very complex way uh, a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, processes from uh, vasodilation and vasoconstriction all the way to ensuring that uh, the, the vessel walls remain impermeable to certain substances. Uh, transport, which is a the main theme of my work, uh, takes different uh, guises and it doesn't necessarily have to be transport of a fluid. It can be transport of other things. In this case, I'm showing an example of transport of uh, cells, of individual cells uh, that we seed into a bioreactor that has flow, that makes nutrients and oxygen go from one side to the other. The cells sense the environment around them. They sense, um, for example, nutrient concentration, metabolite concentration, oxygen concentration. Uh, they get stressed. They like certain areas. They don't like other areas. They may move. They may die. This is an interesting example also from the computer science perspective of bringing two very different modalities of simulation together. In this case, uh, transport phenomena, CFD, many people call it, and agent-based uh, based modeling. And we can take this argument a bit further, which is something that's very contemporary, very topical right now. This is the real uh, emergency department floor plan for Whittington Hospital, one of the hospitals uh, in, uh, in the UCLH Trust. Uh, and uh, using agent-based modeling, we are tracking uh, the movement of people and pieces of equipment, machinery right now. So, uh, I'm not going to go into great detail here. Yellow are patients that enter from the bottom. They go wait in some waiting area. And through a very complicated set of rules, that is grounded in reality. In the protocols of this particular hospital, of this emergency room, we are checking to see uh, where there are congestions, whether we can add or subtract nurses, doctors, pieces of equipment, rearrange the, the furniture or the, the room's arrangement in order to remove bottlenecks and take away, let's say, make the four hours average uh, waiting time in the NHS down to three hours without uh, killing the cost. Uh, these are examples of, uh, of uh, transport phenomena we are studying. Uh, I am very interested in uh, what, I cons what I call organ le level integrative uh, modeling simulation, which sometimes people mention, uh, call first principles modeling. Uh, both mean roughly the same thing. Uh, it means that we take some laws of nature that we kind of understand, like, for example, conservation of momentum that I have written in, in the simplest form you can find there, and uh, put them uh, in a form that can describe the behavior of specific uh, organs. And hopefully, we can get a piece of paper and solve those equations and get the, the answers we want or in most cases we cannot do that on a piece of paper and we put them on the computer and we get answers. There are two ways, there are two almost philosophies uh, as far as how you do that. The first one is that you're trying to make a representation of the organ you're interested uh, to be as comprehensive as possible, as close to reality. And in that case, you can capture both the physiological um, operation but then you can start tweaking levers and knobs in, the, in your model and represent disease, represent therapy, re represent uh, you know, prognosis. Or you can have more targeted, more uh, reduced models that are looking at one aspect of the operation. And usually 
approaches founded in reality sit between the two. Uh, I want to talk about the brain for just a minute. Uh, what I said right now is that we can start for first principles, we can model the operation, and then at the end of this pipeline, we can have uh, arguments about the real function of that organ. For the brain, this is pretty difficult because the real function of the brain is what we're doing right now, is to think. And the to think part is still not captured by equations well. So this last bit, as far as the brain pipeline, we don't have the tools yet to put in place. We can say if uh, a certain part of the brain is in a decent uh, condition as far as oxygenation, as far as metabolism, as far as clearance, etc. But we cannot say whether that part of the brain is functioning well, is producing the kind of thoughts and memories and uh, um, cognitive outcomes that we expect. This is something that we cannot cover based on first principles yet. So we have to cover using other techniques that I may have uh, some time to, to speak about further down. So uh, some basic ideas regarding the brain. Uh, something that, is, uh, that has been with us for a long time is the Monroe-Kelly principle or Monroe-Kelly doctrine, which says that because the brain, in order to be protected, it's part of the evolution of the, the organ, is um, engulfed, is an, uh, encompassed in a, in a rigid skull, this means that the blood that goes in uh, needs to display something for that circulation to happen. So the bit that is displaced effectively in a very simplistic way is something that's called CSF, the cerebrospinal fluid, which is for better or for worse water. It's like uh, very pure water with some proteins uh, in it. So as the blood goes in, uh, water goes out, and this is actually not just a principle, it's something that we can measure very accurately. If you do MRI of the spine, for example, you can see the cerebrospinal fluid going up and down the spinal cord at some speed, let's say three, four, five centimeters per second. So this is something that's well documented and uh, well known for, for some time. Something, however, that is uh, a bit more nuanced and it needs to be mentioned, needs to be uh, addressed here, is the fact that uh, the, the fluids that exist in the brain find themselves in a wide variety of uh, enclosures of environments. So the biggest environment, the biggest uh, uh, container for fluids in the brain is some openings in the center that we're going to see uh, later on that are called the ventricles. These are pretty big, they are centimeters in, uh, in size and they are filled with pure CSF, pure cerebrospinal fluid. Then you go to different uh, areas, let's say the, the space between the skull and the brain, the subarachnoid space, which is millimeters or less. And then as you go to smaller and smaller and smaller scales, you end up to channels, uh, water channels at the top of cells uh, that go through transmembrane uh, channels, uh, transmembrane proteins that allow water transport through in and out of cells that are angstrom in, uh, in size. All those scales, the centimeter to us angstrom, have to work together for this regulation of fluids and water in the brain to function well. And this is something we must keep uh, into, into our minds. Now, uh, my goal, my ultimate goal is to come up with ideas that have to do with uh, modeling of this environment, simulation of this environment. Uh, I want to, to make a very brief argument regarding how difficult it is to simulate directly. Now, what I have here is a, a small schematic from a, a very interesting paper, a, a seminal paper in my view that was published in 2013, um, that shows a tiny little amount of brain, so to speak, that has a little capillary, it has a little vein, it has a bit of a few neurons and a few astrocytes and shows how uh, water goes from, um, and oxygen and other things go from the arterial side to the vein side. Now this, what I'm, the, the picture here is 50 microns. A brain would have six billion units of those. There would be a few thousand of those in a single voxel in the MRI. 
to model directly a single one of those elements is pretty much impossible even today. Uh, imagine how far we are from modeling uh, with some direct technique the whole brain that is tens of orders of magnitude away from computational, uh, as far as computational efforts from where we are. Uh, I want to, to emphasize this point even more. So I mentioned uh, a little uh, while ago the, the, the channels that uh, the transmembrane proteins that take water in and out of uh, cells, or let's say of uh, astrocytes in the brain. So this is a molecular dynamic simulation of a single channel like that. It was done by a very uh, active group in this domain in, uh, in uh, Urbana. Uh, you can see the water molecules at the top, the water molecules at the bottom, and you can see water molecules going in a single file from the top to the bottom. There is one of them that's yellow. This is again a single molecule that is colored yellow in order we can, so we can track it. This simulation, the simulation of a single channel is uh, quite a substantial molecular dynamics computational task. So it takes uh, a supercomputer a few hours to do a simulation like that properly and uh, think that a single astrocyte cell has patches on it and each patch may have four or five thousand channels like that. So the direct way probably will not work. Uh, what can we do uh, in order to account for transport phenomena and uh, in, in, a, in a computationally meaningful feasible way? I have a medium on the left here which is uh, uh, a very simple metal foam, basically. It's just a, an open um, foam uh, made of aluminium with channels and pores. And uh, on the right, I have a direct simulation of flow through a small portion of that, like a, a representative portion, maybe 10, 20 pores. And that is a, se a serious task. It is impossible, it is inconceivable for me to simulate the entirety of this pore on the left, or this uh, porous medium on the left, the way I, I am showing uh, on the right. The right is a few pores, the left is uh, thousands of millions of pores. So this problem fortunately has been solved for us. It is called homogenization. It is uh, using statistics in order to aggregate areas of common behavior and uh, instead of having to simulate a thousand pores that I would have uh, in the, for the medium on the left, now I only have to simulate 15 elements effectively, three times five, 15 elements, which is uh, a much more tractable uh, proposition as long as I know how do each one of those elements behave statistically. Uh, this comes, of course, from the area of porous media, from da Darcy's law and uh, extensions of those laws that allow us to characterize such porous media in uh, good detail with quantities as far as porosity, permeability, uh, permeability vectors or tensors if they are an, an isotropic media, permeabilities that may change with uh, flow if uh, the flow, uh, the, the velocity, the, the flow range within the media uh, becomes too wide, etc. It is an area that is, I'm not going to say perfectly understood, but there have been great progress in, um, in continuum mechanics as far as porous media. There is an extension, however, here. Uh, the brain is not uh, a solid uh, aluminum uh, porous foam. It is tissue that deforms in a, in a million different ways. So, in on top of actually having to solve the flow into this medium, I also need to include some information on how this medium deforms by flow conditions, by pressure, or how deformation gives uh, rise to flow. And I, have, I think I have captured, I hope this video is play on your uh, remote connections, I think I have captured these two elements that um, actually connect very well with this Monroe Kelly doctrine. So the lilo at the top is an example of a porous medium where uh, flow creates the formation of the solid ma matrix. I inflate the, the lilo and the, the lilo becomes stiffer, bigger. Uh, it deforms, the, the solid deforms. 
The chap on the bottom right does the opposite thing. Basically, he applies deformation and generates flow in a porous medium again. The brain, for the brain, both those processes happen at the same time. So we need a framework that can capture that. Uh, now, I mentioned before the differences in scales in the brain, and this is a real problem that we had to consider quite deeply before we uh, think about formulating equa equations, even the poroelastic equations. The first approach we, we, we pursued was to assume that every opening in the brain is occupied by the same fluid and there's only one class of openings. I don't have a slide about that. It's a very simple approach. Uh, I would call it in, with today's language, a single network for elastic theory. Uh, very soon we realized that that is not enough because uh, as we saw in the pictures before, there are little openings, there are bigger openings. And uh, so we tried to, to start classifying those. And we came up, uh, we, we, we concluded that uh, a multiple network for elastic theory is probably what's appropriate to simulate the brain. The bulk of, my, of our work has been done with something that's called the four uh, network for, for elastic model. And I want to spend a minute explaining why and what those four networks are. So uh, guided by the physiology, we say that uh, in a small volume, four compartments coexist. One compartment is the arterial blood, which is the bigger uh, arteries in that compartment. Then this compartment feeds uh, in a one-way manner the smaller, the, the capillary bed, basically the smallest level of vessels. Some of the flow of this, um, of this, of the liquid that goes, or the blood that goes into the capillary bed, goes directly into the, the veins and gets drained out of the system, out of that compartment. And some of it actually extravasates, uh, seeps, filters through the vessel wall into uh, the outside environment. And that is uh, this outside environment we call the CSF environment. So it's everything that is not vascular is captured in a single uh, compartment that we call the CSF compartment. Uh, not all compartments can transfer mass and uh, liquid to all the other compartments. This, as I said, is guided by the physiology. Uh, I will skip the slide and go to the next level of our understanding. So it was clear after a while, and especially after the 2013 2015 papers that were published, um, that uh, there is. Uh, an intermediate world as far as fluid transport in the brain. And this is something that has to be taken into account by any model of this time. Basically, this intermediate world says that uh, the, uh, the water that goes out of the capillaries doesn't just go into a single compartment, but it may have very different fates. It may stay in the perivascular system, these annular rings that are around the, the, the arteries and the arterioles in the brain. We call this now the glymphatic uh, environment. It's a glial lymphatic uh, play of words. Or it can actually go inside the cells. It can uh, be sucked inside the astrocytes mainly, and it can change the volume of the astrocytes or it can actually be at the outside of all these environments and be really uh, the extracellular, um, uh, intracellular uh, CSF uh, uh, fluid, cerebrospinal fluid. So basically we have taken the single compartment we have in the M4 MPET model and we have broken this down to three compartments and we believe that this works a lot uh, better. Now, uh, it doesn't make a difference whether we demonstrate this in the four or the six MPET. I will use the four MPET because that's that's a bit the, the slides are just a bit tidier. This casts itself in uh, in a few equations. These equations, the top, uh, the, the bottom four, uh, correspond to pressure and velocity and transport for each one of the four compartments. So each compartment maintains its own, its own pressure and there are transport terms from compartment to compartment 
that take into account uh, how flow how fluid may be transferred or not transferred from one to the other. The top equation is uh, the equation that involves this quantity G, which is effectively the material properties, and this is a, a stress-strain relationship written uh, in, this, uh, in this formulation. So these five equations basically together, they account for my five unknowns, the four pressures of the various compartments, and the strain uh, of uh, the solid matrix. Of course, in a fully discretized, multi-dimensional world, uh, each one of those has, uh, for example, the strain is not a number, it's several, uh, it's, it's, it's a whole tensor, so they, they break down to quite a few individual unknowns. I have just highlighted a few terms on the right in red. Those terms are uh, 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 the, the only places in these equations where time appears. These are basically velocity and acceleration terms, inertia terms for that, uh, I, I, sh I should say. In most formulations of uh, uh, for elasticity, these, these terms are completely neglected, they are ignored. The reason for that is that for most applications of the MPET uh, 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 paradigm, uh, the time scales involved are extremely slow. If we are talking about, uh, let's say, hydrocephalus, uh, the condition develops over days at best or over years at worst. If we are talking about more other types of dementia, let's say uh, vascular dementia, it takes years to develop. So the inertial terms are not really important. We have um, a couple of applications where they are, and that's why we've kept them there. So uh, I won't spend too much time there. This produces a, an interesting uh, matrix. There are some terms that are called cross storage terms, and they have to do with how um, pressure change in one compartment changes uh, the pressure and the volume in other compartments. Again, in our formulation, this is something that's been neglected. Um, we have written in-house uh, code in order to make this uh, happen. Uh, second, first and second order elements. It's a deformation pressure formulation we are pursuing. It is done by iteration because it is very, the very non-linear uh, system. And at the end of the day, this means that you have uh, a discretization, which is any traditional finite element mesh. In our case, it's always a tetrahedral mesh. Uh, the the interesting the, the twist here is that each one of those elements, each one of these cells, uh, actually is not a single material, a single type of behavior. It is four or six interpenetrating compartments that coexist in that cell, and this is something that we need to remember. So I'm going to present two classes of uh, results. Uh, the first one is a condition that's called hydrocephalus or hydrocephalus, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And basically, it has to do with a disturbance of uh, flow of the cerebrospinal fluid in the brain that leads, uh, in most cases, to the enlargement of the ventricles. You see in this uh, top right figure, for example, this black area in the middle, these are the ventricles, the two big lateral ventricles in the center of the brain. These are supposed to be relatively small, about this size, two, three uh, centimeters. Uh, in the hydrocephalus uh, disease, these may enlarge, they may, may become bigger. And the reason they become bigger is because CSF is produced to a great extent at the internal surfaces of some of these ventricles. And if there is an obstruction somehow in the outflow, the pressure inside that domain, in, inside this cavity, uh, increases and the ventricles enlarge. This is most cases of hydrocephalus, like for example, acute or chronic hydrocephalus. You may get acute hydrocephalus, touch on wood, uh, if, uh, because of an accident. An accident creates a, a blockage somewhere in the outflow of CSF and you get this type of uh, issue, or because of a tumor growth, whatever. There is a condition, however, that's called normal pressure hydrocephalus, which uh, uh, the clinical uh, image of the patient is almost identical to, to the hydrocephalus uh, um, uh, symptoms. Uh, there is incontinence, there is problems in gait, problems in cognition, etc. 
the issue is it's called a very paradoxical condition because you don't know where the obstruction is uh, radiographically ct and pet x-ray um, uh, mri uh, cannot show where the the problem is where the obstruction the blockage is uh, so you don't get this elevated pressure overall or you don't get um, any any uh, picture where the doctor can say okay if i remove this obstacle the flow will be restored the csf flow will be restored the patient will be cured however the clinical uh, symptoms are there now the way we present results for this kind of condition is um, is, uh, is an aggregate basically uh, think of the brain like this uh, i take a line from the center um, here at the, at the surface of the ventricles all the way to the surface of the brain this line is here and these are the dimensions these are the let's say a three centimeter uh, ventricular uh, diameter here all the way to 10 to the side and i'm recording values along this line it may be pressure it may be deformation the interesting value in this case is deformation so uh, remember the bottom axis in this graph shows uh, on the left hand side the ventricular wall the wall of that balloon of that cavity in the center of the brain and the right hand side is the skull the right hand side the movement the deformation of the of the brain tissue is zero because the skull is rigid so it won't go anywhere what we have tried to do what we have tried to explore here is uh, a hypothesis that was first published to the best of my knowledge in 2008 a paper by bradley saying that the normal pressure hydrocephalus might be a two hit disease so there are two different things happening at the same time each one of them is not very important it's not doesn't generate a lot of clinical outcomes but if you put the two together they are actually uh, quite serious so the two things i'm putting together here is uh, this red line uh, at the very top of this diagram which include two types of modification of microscopic parameters in this model uh, increase in arterial capillary compliance so make them more compliant and increase in the leakiness of the capillaries towards the csf each one of those on its own doesn't do much but if you put the two together uh, pay a bit of attention to the number at the bottom left of this diagram it's 0 0.04 this is telling us that the ventricular wall deformed by four centimeters which is a very extreme but it's good because we can demonstrate with this, that kind of extreme uh, behavior it's a very extreme deformation that you would see in a in a normal pressure hydrocephalus patient so this is an example where a model like this is introducing plausible uh, modifications uh, vulnerabilities if you wish at the microscopic level at the level that you wouldn't be able to see with the naked eye in the brain uh, tissue and physiology and the result is a very mic microscopic clinically relevant uh, deformation pushing of the ventricular wall by four centimeters which is a rather big number this was a, one of the early results we got with this method that uh, showed uh, quite quite a lot of problems we were very happy to get that the second bit we did and this is work we did with Alex actually and his team uh, was uh, to try to see if we can apply this kind of uh, thinking into what remains even today the most uh, serious condition as far as uh, the brain is concerned dementia so uh, we collected a number of uh, cases from a hospital in, um, in uh, Venice, uh, 50 controls and 50 uh, patients with mild cognitive impairment. Uh, and we did some imaging and some uh, uh, cardio, uh, uh, cardiovascular monitoring. Uh, and I will say just a word, uh, a couple of words about those in a, in a second. What uh, we are looking for in this case is two particular characteristics that are uh, offered as a natural output from a model like the one I'm describing. The first one is at the local microscopic level, 
what does the blood flow compartment say the velocities are? This is a, a surrogate measure, an equivalent, if you wish, of cerebral blood perfusion. We can get this information from the model at the at the vascular uh, at the at the voxel level. The second bit of information that we can get that is not easy to get through imaging is uh, what we call now clearance. Basically, this is what is the velocity of the extracellular CSF uh, fluid uh, as it moves in the various parts of the brain. The reason we are interested in that is because there is uh, not still 100% bulletproof evidence, but there is very strong indications that the local velocity of the CSF may have something to do with uh, the transport or conversely the deposition of uh, metabolite related uh, proteins at certain parts of the brain. So uh, neurons, for example, may excrete uh, proteins, products of their metabolism that may stay close to the neuron or may be transported away if the velocity of the CSF locally is high enough. Uh, so the model gives those two numbers quite di directly. And uh, through um, uh, some fairly complicated and sophisticated uh, image processing and uh, uh, hemodynamics processing, we managed to personalize the model for the 100 patients uh, and controls that we basically had. Uh, just a word here, there were different types of imaging that were done to those, uh, those patients. Something that was important to us was uh, that uh, there was diffusion tensor um, MRI, which gives directionality as far as uh, transport. And from that directionality, the team in uh, Leeds actually managed to, to extract the permeability tensor from uh, from the imaging in a local uh, patient-specific manner. So real maps of uh, permeability. Uh, and this informs the transport for the model uh, quite significantly. At the same time, uh, the patients were, uh, um, uh, were uh, uh, examined using uh, ultrasound as far as the carotids. Uh, and uh, they also underwent 24 hours halter measurements and through another rather sophisticated model again that was done by the, uh, the team in Leeds. Um, very interesting high and low activity um, velocity flow profiles were extracted for the four arteries that uh, feed the brain, the two carotids and the two vertebral arteries. And those, again, were personalized and not just personalized for the individual, they were, they, we could tune them regarding the levels of activity. So we did computations for high levels of activity, which would probably be when the subjects are walking or doing some exercise, and the lowest level of activity, in no likelihood, this is when they are asleep. And uh, we found a way to map those velocities, those flows for the four feeding vessels, into different territories on the brain and thus force our model. Uh, what kind of outputs can this uh, model generate? So for example, uh, we can get uh, numbers like what you see in this figure, which involve um, uh, pressure, they involve uh, uh, clearance, uh, basically the dust velocity for the CSF department and other quantities of this, uh, of this type. Uh, beyond treating the brain as a whole and also the brain as a collection of a million or five million or 10 million computational cells, there is something in between that is really interesting. And this is work that is still going on actually. Uh, John is pursuing this. Uh, we can separate different parts of the brain uh, according to their physiology. Like, for example, we can look at what's happening at the hippocampus. The hippocampus in our world is the collection of these 27,000 uh, cells uh, in our computational model, computational cells. And if we put those together, we can see how the hippocampus of a, uh, let's say, 70-year-old 
smoker male subject with a mild cognitive impairment that differs from the hippocampus of the subject that uh, is uh, a non-smoker for that matter. And uh, we can put a lot of these results together and create uh, uh, some interesting statistics. And the interesting statistics show that there are differences actually between these populations. So there are clear differences between men and women. There are clear differences between MCI and, uh, and, um, um, and uh, controls. And uh, what is more interesting is that these differences are not uh, global around the brain. They are actually concentrated in specific parts of uh, the brain, or they are a lot more uh, accentuated in those per particular parts. They are not uh, uniform everywhere. Uh, the, the statistical significance of those differences are actually uh, significant, I have to say, and uh, this is something that uh, we are trying to explore right now as far as its real uh, predictive capability. So what we hope uh, that this model can do is actually take this kind of insight, especially as far as clearance, for example, for specific domains, for the hippocampus, uh, for example, and feed it into, as an additional virtual biomarker, into bigger models, into models of uh, the disease that take into account a lot of additional information, like different types of imaging, like the neurological, psychological tests uh, and memory tests that are, remain the, the cornerstone for diagnosis and differentiation of, uh, of dementia, uh, like um, possibly um, more invasive tests like uh, lumbar puncture that extracts uh, CSF and uh, takes it through uh, um, uh, examination that uh, is very expensive, is invasive, but remains the, the gold standard as far as uh, uh, this kind of uh, diagnosis. So hopefully this type of modeling can provide one additional input that is not easy to replicate because like, for example, clearance is not possible to get to the best of my knowledge through any other, uh, through any imaging technique and uh, increase the level of confidence that these predictive uh, models, um, that these predictive environments for, uh, for disease differentiation and diagnosis have. Uh, I understand that I'm at 50 minutes. I think I will wrap up now. Um, so, uh, the question that I wanted to answer and uh, probably motivate some thinking is whether first principles mechanistic models can be used for uh, the brain or other organs. I would say that for the brain is probably the most difficult case that you can imagine because the ultimate functionality of the brain, which is the thinking, is the cognitive functions, it's very difficult to attach mechanistic models to that. It is a lot easier to do that for the lungs or for the kidneys to other organs that are prime targets for, uh, uh, for, uh, for elasticity. Some conditions, even in the brain, are easier and more mechanical than others. And I use these two examples with um, the, the normal pressure hydrocephalus, which is a condition that is mostly mechanical to the best of our understanding, uh, all the way to dementia that has every uh, aspect in the book, a lot of biochemistry, a lot of uh, uh, pro protein dynamics, possibly, etc. Uh, moreover, some conditions um, are easier to simulate because they take seconds to develop. And of course, the most uh, extreme of that is something I didn't speak at all about, traumatic brain injury. And some other conditions take years, like dementia. So you need to simulate years of patient time and uh, multi-scale techniques in time come into play in that case. I didn't say anything about uh, neuronal remodeling. This is something that's clearly missing from what uh, we have been doing. We have doubled a bit in that. We know roughly how to do it, but we haven't done any serious studies. Ne neuronal remodeling means that the conditions, uh, let's say, of uh, transport around a particular group of neurons inform the future of those neurons and feed back into the model as far as change of properties, let's say permeability, for that part. So you create feedback loops and you need simple rules or not so simple rules for that matter 
that tell you how that remodeling takes place. There is a lot of expertise on uh, vascular remodeling. Neuronal remodeling is a, is a, is a, is a different story. The, at the end of the day, what we think we can do is that we can uh, develop these in silico models and apply vulnerabilities on those models. And then we can test both for interventions, invasive interventions, pharmacological treatments, or just looking at how the disease evolves and uh, for dementia, for hydrocephalus, and for other conditions that we have uh, uh, been interested in, I think that there is quite valuable insight that can be extracted from, uh, from those uh, types of simulations. There are a few people that I need to mention. Of course, John has been uh, uh, a cornerstone uh, of the effort to develop this kind of modeling. Together with the UCL team, uh, Li Wei Dean, who's now in Taiwan, and the person that started that for us many years ago, Brett Ali. Uh, I also uh, want to acknowledge the help from uh, the Leeds team, Alex and his um, colleagues. And I want to put uh, one last touch there. Um, I personally have learned a lot about the basic physiology of the brain from the people in Oslo, uh, Ole Peter Ottesen and his group that evolved over the years. And uh, I want to mention in particular uh, Erlend Nagelhus, who is not with us, unfortunately, anymore who has been a friend and a collaborator and has uh, taught us a lot about uh, how we can ground this type of work into uh, reality. Uh, thank you for your attention. I hope that I have not been speaking to myself all this time and that everybody has actually had audio. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks a lot, Yanis. Um, I could follow you throughout, so at least you had one listener. Excellent. <laughs> Um, well, thanks a lot. So we have now the opportunity to, to ask questions uh, for a few minutes. So if you could, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, if you want to ask a question, you can raise your hand through um, the option you have for that. You need to choose the participants tab and then there is a place say raise your hand. You can also put questions through the chat. Uh, just to, to um, get it started, Yanis. Uh, um, can you elaborate a bit more on the neuronal remodeling uh, part that you were mentioning at the end? Uh, you, you're right that in the area of uh, cardiovascular diseases, that's something where there is a lot of mechanobiology work that has been done. Um, can you tell us a bit more about what you think is happening there? And are there specific diseases where, you know, within the limited knowledge that we have, there is more advanced made in that, that space oh. in the brain? Yeah, that, that's, that's a very good point, and it's something that I am very interested in right now. Unfortunately, we don't have the, the resource to work on this at this point, but it's uh, a top priority as far as I'm concerned. So I can um, elucidate that very well, I think, with an example. Uh, think of a group of neurons. I'll use the same example I used in the talk. Think of a group of neurons. Think uh, of that group of neurons being producing uh, metabolites, let's say tau, amyloid, beta, something around there. There are two possibilities. Either that uh, production of metabolites gets advected and taken away by proper flow conditions around those neurons, if we accept the hypothesis for clearance, or uh, these, uh, the velocities there are not enough to transport those substances far away. In the second scenario, those substances are going to to, to stay in the vicinity of those neurons, probably get deposited in the immediate vicinity on the neurons for that matter. And uh, we know that uh, the positions of this type of metabolites are um, uh, deleterious to the, to, the, to the neurons. They can cause neuron death. They can cause demyelination to start with. So if the, the conditions there are such that the neurons are stressed that way by the presence of those substances, then uh, the myelin seeds will probably thin. They will become thinner and smaller. If the myelin uh, seeds become thinner, then this means that you will have more space, more free space around that neuron. If you have more free space, it means that your porosity and permeability around those neurons goes up which means that you are reducing the resistance, which means that you're making the flow around that group of neurons easier. 
if the flow becomes easier, higher velocities possibly, it means that you're going to be transporting more of those quantities away. So this is how the loop closes. It is a mechanism that uh, is detrimental to the neuron, but it carries with it a, a counteractive mechanism that should probably alleviate the negative effects of the first one. The interplay between those two, you cannot second guess. You need the modeling, you need the simulation. Maybe not necessarily this type of simulation, but you need some mathematical tool in order to quantify, because the devil is in the details in these things, which one of the two wins. Uh, a more extreme scenario would be that the neuron dies completely. It gets necrosed. If it gets necrosed, eventually it dissolves and it leaves some open space there. So the resistance there goes through the floor. It would mean a lot easier flow, a lot more flow in that, in that region. So it is this type of uh, idea that we would like to introduce. I only brought one example, one rule, if you wish, on how this coupling may take place. There are, I'm sure, many, many rules of this type that uh, someone should be exploring. Are, are you, I mean, in a sense, if I understand correctly, the example you gave is still within the realm of, of physics, right? Because it's about uh, essentially improving or not clearance. But do, do you, is there any evidence uh, that you're aware of in terms of things more like it happens in vascular remodeling, where actually the stress is on the, on the cells can change the biological behavior of the cells. So, you know, more like secreting of, of substances or not secreting of them. I am sure that there are processes like that. And uh, the fact that you get demyelination is not physics. It's effectively a chemi biochemical reaction, which in a comprehensive integrative model should be taken into account as such, as a reaction. And of course, there are other players into, into this picture that have to do with metabolism, metabolism itself, and the transport of oxygen and nutrients to the cells. Uh, it has to do with osmotic loads that are not taken into account in what we're doing so far. That, again, will, I'm sure, play a big role. Uh, I don't have the answers as far as what are the more important uh, uh, processes there. I'm just, I just know that it's something that needs to be explored. Thank you. Any other one wanted to ask questions? I, I see. Yeah, there you go. I think we need to start unmuting people. Ralph Richter. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, Ralph, sorry. Ralph, go ahead, please. <laughs> yeah, hello. Thanks, Janus, for the invitation. I had a question on the hydrocephalus example that you gave. Um, the, you illustrated how a change in compliance plus um, enhanced flow can change the conditions dramatically. How, what was the magnitude of these changes? Are we talking of 10% change in compliance or a factor of 10? Or, or what's, the uh, magnitude, what's the relative change roughly that we talk about here? So that's, that's a very good question. Uh, I should have included a, a link to the paper that uh, we explored these things. Uh, the truth of the matter is that we did not have physiological evidence as far as what kind of changes uh, are physiologically relevant or important. So what we did in that paper was that we did a very systematic multidimensional uh, parametric analysis of all the parameters that were at play in that model. And uh, we found that uh, it wasn't dramatic changes that created this, this effect. So we, we, we did change, as you said, like minus to plus three orders of magnitude from what we consider to be the, the normal physiological value. And we found that if you double something, it is enough to actually give you this kind of effects. Thanks. Um, I think there is a question from Homa Nasseri. Yeah. Would you like to? Uh, thank you very much. Um, I would uh, like to ask if uh, it's possible to um, look into charged particles or if you have already included this in your submodels to model the um, transport of the signals in the neuron and then uh, hopefully to uh, relate that to cognitive function. No, the, the quick answer is no. Uh, 
I think that uh, you, you phrased the question very nicely. Is it possible? I think it is possible to a certain extent. Uh, it is not just charged particles, it's also potentials on neurons, etc. And we know how to create sub-models. Uh, when I say we, I don't mean us, I mean the, the community. Know how to create sub-models that can account for that. And uh, I think that, again, the choice of the term sub-models is great because this is one of the greatest strengths of this model, that it's very easy to plug in sub-models for different processes. Uh, as far as I know, to the best of my knowledge, nobody has done that. It would be an amazing way to extend this kind of work. I think the probably, you know, following a bit on Homer's question, would that be, if we try to, to look at the simile in a different domain, would be some of the electrophysiology models that are used in cardiology um, this is similar in the sense that they tend to use it as if you formulate the problem in terms of currents or um, as sort of additional terms that come from the more micro scale uh, and that's what one would need to link to some of the more physics variables that you have in your model. So you, you know what I'm thinking uh, you can follow this line of thinking and uh, take one additional step towards cognitive uh, functions it will not take you all the way because even if you can include this and even if you can get a, let's say quite exact um, uh, electric signals and you can map those signals to ECG for example or some other modality that uh, records uh, even fMRI for that matter that records what's happening when you're thinking this brings you one step beyond the health and physiology, but there are many, many steps to go towards cognitive functions. If you know that these neurons are active and they produce this kind of signal, you still cannot tell if the thoughts they are having are, you know, healthy, if the memory is there, if all the, the higher cognitive functions are, uh, are indeed in place. So it would definitely be a very substantial improvement, a very substantial step forward in terms of the science, it doesn't take us all the way. There is still a, a lot of distance to, to, to go to cognition. Thank you. So I think we are um, on time. I just want to ask a last, uh, if there is anybody else who has any additional question before we leave. Okay, otherwise, uh, thanks to everybody and thanks Yanis in particular to you for the great talk. Uh, uh, I, I forgot to say at the beginning that this was originally meant to be a physical seminar and of course for obvious reasons we had to change but we, we really look forward to the opportunity to, to have uh, Yanis with us in Leeds uh, at uh, hopefully the near future. Uh, so thanks everyone. Uh, my understanding is that uh, Claire has um, also a recording of the talk so we'll make sure that it gets to you Yanis as well. Cheers. Um, Thank you. Thanks, everybody. This has been a very positive experience. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate the attention and the invitation. Very good. Well, thanks, everyone. Have a good, good day.